Hello, welcome to another virtual program from Maine Historical Society. My name is Kathleen Newman. It's February 22nd, 2024. And this is Maine and the West Indies Trade with Seth Goldstein. Now, before we begin our program, um, before we begin Seth's uh, talk with us this evening, we're going to just take a moment to uh, remember and to recognize that Maine Historical Society recognizes what is currently referred to as Maine is Wabanaki homelands, a place the Wabanaki people have been stewarding for over 13,000 years. Wherever we are in Maine, we are on Wabanaki homelands, and we recognize the inherent sovereignty of the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations within these lands and waters. Understanding Wabanaki history is vital to understanding Maine, and we are committed to helping provide education about this history through partnerships with Wabanaki people. Joining us this evening is historian Seth Goldstein. He grew up on Cape Cod, where he developed his passion for maritime history. He has a bachelor's degree in European history from the University of California at Santa Cruz and his master's in history, or excuse me, his master's in world history from Northeastern University. His research interests include historic North Atlantic fishery, global piracy, New England shipwrecks and lighthouses, the whaling industry, and Maine's connection to the Atlantic world African enslavement. He has worked for Greater Portland Landmarks and the Portland Harbor Museum. Seth taught at the University of New England, Southern Maine Community College, and the Maine College of Art and Design. He's currently director of the South Portland Historical Society's Cushing Point, Cushing's Point Museum and the director of development for the South Portland Historical Society. And I believe, Seth, that at Cushing's Point, um, you're going to have a new exhibit opening this spring, uh, Tools and Labor in South Portland, uh, which will open on May 1st, correct? That's correct, Kathleen. Excellent. We look forward to seeing that and uh, looking forward to your talk this evening. Thank you so much for being here with us. Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, pleasure to be here with you all this evening, virtually. Um, I like to start off my lecture on the West Indies trade uh, with a quote from William Hutchinson Rowe's um, Maritime History of Maine, which he published in 1948. Um, in this book, he has a chapter called uh, The West India Trade. This is chapter six of his book, uh, a chapter devoted to uh, a lot of what I'm going to share with you this evening. So kind of uh, Maine's um, economic ties with the Caribbean or the West Indies, goods that were shipped from Maine uh, to the islands of the West Indies, and then goods that were uh, return shipped from the West Indies back here to Maine. Um, and uh, as I said, gentleman devotes an entire chapter uh, to this trade. And he says in the chapter, quote, uh, regardless of what was to be a Maine boy's occupation or profession, an indispensable part of his upbringing was a voyage or two in the West India trade. Um, and so what he's saying here is that, you know, regardless of if you were going to be a lawyer or a blacksmith or a cooper, uh, it was very common in the 19th century for young men from Maine to make at least one voyage to the West Indies. This would have been an opportunity for them to have seen part of the world before they settled down, maybe sow their royal oats, if you will. Um, and as I said, he goes on to describe uh, all these various commodities, and I will quote from him. Uh, kind of throughout the lecture. However, in the entire chapter devoted to the West India trade, Mr. Rowe never once mentions enslaved Africans. So these are the individuals who are generating all of the wealth in the Atlantic world, who are producing the sugar, molasses, and rum that are consumed here in Maine, and they are omitted from this chapter in the Maine Maritime History book, uh, The West India Trade. And so it's got me thinking, you know, as I read this chapter several years ago, that this was symbolic in some ways of how we treat our maritime history here in Maine, 
and in New England. Uh, we revere our maritime heritage here. I think uh, of the main Mariners, our um, semi-professional hockey team in Portland. Uh, I consider the Caravelle weather vane on the uh, City Hall in Portland or the various schools that have mascots related to the maritime trades. So we kind of put our maritime history on a pedestal here in Maine. Uh, we fail to ask really thoughtful questions about this maritime heritage, like where were these vessels sailing to? Uh, what were they transporting from Maine? And what were they bringing in return? And who produced these commodities? And so that is part of what I'd like to share with you this evening, uh, a correction, if you will, uh, of taking this maritime history out of the realm of nostalgia and bringing it into the realm of what actually transpired historically. So let's take a look at this first map here. Uh, this is early in the um, colonial period. You can see exports and returns from New England, 1650. Uh, this was in a book uh, about the mass trade. And so if we can look at your screen, you can see uh, commodities going from, in this case, Barbados, uh, once again, early in the colonial period. So Barbados, a English colony in the Caribbean or West Indies. And we see from Barbados to New England, molasses, sugar, and rum, and going to Barbados from Maine and New England, red oak staves, lumber, and fish. And once again, coming up from Barbados, molasses and sugar and rum. However, you know what's not pictured in this map is the enslaved Africans. And so if we look at this map here from the National Park Service, we'll see that this map includes enslaved Africans on the Middle Passage from West Africa being brought to the Caribbean. And then we see what historians call the Second Middle Passage. Uh, the Second Middle Passage goes from the West Indies to New England. And this is the method, by and large, by which enslaved Africans come to New England and Maine. In fact, very few enslaved Africans come directly from Africa to New England. Most of them come on this second middle passage. Sometimes these enslaved individuals would spend some time in the West Indies. Uh, sometimes they would be the enslaved Africans who hadn't been purchased in the West Indies. Uh, and then the merchants would bring them uh, here to New England uh, and the final leg of their voyage, along with uh, molasses, sugar, and rum. And so um, one of the first gentlemen engaged in this trade, what became known as the West India trade, was Colonel Ezekiel Cushing. Uh, and he was based right here in South Portland, where I am uh, this evening. And he was based out of what was known as Symington Cove. Uh, today, better known as Willard Beach, but still known by some as Symington Cove. So he's one of the first gentlemen involved in this exchange, Colonel Ezekiel Cushing. And he likely purchased his enslaved Africans as part of his involvement in the West India trade. And we happen to know the names of Colonel Ezekiel Cushing's uh, enslaved Africans because we have a copy of his will at the South Portland Historical Society. We know they were Cato and Phyllis and a four-year-old girl named Dinah. They're listed as property in his will. And he leaves Cato and Phyllis to his son, Thomas. And he leaves the four-year-old girl, Dinah, to his wife, Mary. Now, as I had said, most enslaved Africans come to New England through the second middle passage. Um, individuals who have been enslaved in the Caribbean on islands such as Barbados, the term that they used to describe them at that time was seasoned. They would use this word seasoned uh, like a piece of wood has been seasoned. And what that implies is that these enslaved Africans had uh, knew some English from their time in the West Indies, and they had some knowledge of European cultural norms. And hence they were referred to as seasoned and they were 
uh, preferred here in New England for that knowledge. Uh, here we see, um, and I'd like to thank my friend Matt Anson for taking this photograph for me. Uh, this is the Nathaniel Knight Ledger of 1734, around about. Uh, Nathaniel Knight was the nephew and the right-hand man of Colonel Thomas Westbrook, who was a mass agent at the time. Uh, and his partner uh, was Samuel Waldo. So, of course, the city of Westbrook, named after Colonel Thomas Westbrook, and Waldoboro, named after Samuel Waldo. And so you can see very, even at this early stage, uh, the significance of some of the luxury commodities uh, here in New England. So sugar, very important. Also tobacco, rum. So if we look at the first arrow there, uh, and these are goods that are being sold to individuals who are working in the mass trade. So this is his ledger. Think of this as kind of like the company store. This is what people purchased, uh, his workmen working in the mass trade. Uh, the first arrow there, uh, sugar and cotton. Once again, sugar. Uh, third arrow down there, tobacco. Uh, colorful spelling of tobacco. Uh, once again, sugar and butter. Uh, and then uh, molasses and tobacco and pork, uh, that last arrow there. So we can see even early uh, in the colonial period that these luxury commodities are being shipped up from the West Indies to Maine and uh, the importance of them. Uh, sugar plantations are considered the first industrial production centers. They combine aspects of agriculture and factory work. And so I'll quote here from Sweetness and Power, which was written by Sidney Mintz. And he says, quote, without boiling and skimming, uh, reducing the juice, there is no way to make granular sugar. It cannot be done without solid technical mastery, particularly in the control of heat. Just as a factory and field worker are wedded in sugar making, Brute field labor and skilled artisanal knowledge are both necessary. And so if you see here in the photographs, we see some uh, enslaved individuals uh, harvesting sugar cane. Uh, on the top left here, you can see this is a sugar press. So there are rollers there that the enslaved individuals would feed the sugar cane into and then uh, the resulting juice that came out of them would be boiled down into granulated sugar. You can see they're turning the mechanisms there using oxen. And this was another commodity that Maine supplied to the West Indies uh, draft animals, uh, horses and oxen, um, by and large. Uh, this was uh, very difficult work, uh, very dangerous work. It had to be done quickly. It had to be done seasonally. Uh, and the cane juice would start to ferment or rot uh, if it wasn't processed in a timely fashion. And so here you can see I have uh, some of the, the dangers of working uh, in the sugar mills. Work in the mills and boiling house unpleasant and dangerous. The work was exhausting and led to uh, horrific accidents. In fact, a slave with a machete stood behind, stood beside the slave who fed the cane into the mill, ready to cut off the arm of the feeder in case they become, became trapped. Sir Thomas Lynch wrote in 1672 that, quote, plantations are subject to an abundance of accidents, especially sugar works because they have so many machines. A contemporary writer, record some of the hazards. And here I quote once again, if a mill feeder be catched by the finger, his whole body is drawn in and is squeezed to pieces. If a boiler gets any part into the scalding sugar, it sticks like glue, uh, glue or bird, bird lime, and it is hard to save either limb or life. So these are the conditions in which the people who are producing this luxury commodity are working in. And you can see uh, just how dangerous that is.
Um, this is a painting of a sugarcane harvest and transportation uh, in Cuba, 1867. Sorry, 1873. And um, those of you who are unaware, slavery is legal in the Spanish colony of Cuba until 1886. Um, so, you know, it continues uh, almost right up until the beginning of the 20th century. Now, the average lifespan of an enslaved African, now this is should they survive the Middle Passage, which was, of course, the the dreaded voyage from Africa to the Americas, and about a fifth of the enslaved individuals did not survive the Middle Passage. But should you survive the Middle Passage, your life expectancy as an enslaved African on the island of Cuba was just seven years. And this is because these enslaved individuals were literally worked to death. The plantation owners calculated that it was more affordable for them to bring in new enslaved Africans from Africa than it was to properly take care of and feed and house these individuals. And hence their life expectancy uh, only seven years. Uh, the painting that you see uh, was by a Portland artist, William F. Chadwick. He lived in Matanzas, Cuba from 1870 to 1876. Uh, his family owned shipping involved with the transport of uh, molasses from Cuba and Guadalupe to Portland. And you can see uh, this bucolic scene that he's painted here uh, doesn't come close to representing the horrors uh, that people in Cuba who were enslaved had to endure. Uh, here you see in front of you, this is a, a letter in the possession of the Maine Historical Society. Uh, this is to Portland resident Elizabeth Munford from a friend who was traveling. Uh, she's in Trinidad, Cuba, July 4th, 1847. She says uh, to Elizabeth, uh, I should like to spend some time in the country. She's in the in the city of Trinidad. She would like to travel around the country were it not for the shrieks of the slaves, which you hear constantly someone or another being nearly all the time at the whipping post. And then I'd like to thank Linda Ashford uh, for giving me permission to take this photograph uh, that she took when she was in Cuba several years ago. So here you see, this is a map of Portland during the colonial period. And so you, um, the quote here, uh, Jedediah Preble, Enoch Isley, and his younger brother Daniel, Simon Mayo, and John Wade, five of the foremost merchants in Falmouth, today known as Portland, together invested in the construction of a large distillery on its own wharf at the far northeastern end of 4th Street. In spite of local interference due to alcohol-related criminality, this operation, overseen by Daniel Isley, was producing enough rum by 1774 to meet substantial regional demand. To be sure, Fiddle Lane, today known as Franklin Arterial, was laid out in 1756, and it was infamous for its watering holes, frequented by laborers and sailors on shore leave in their brief periods of leisure. So you have molasses that's coming up here that's being consumed as molasses, but also molasses that's coming up here from the West Indies that's being distilled uh, into rum. And so very popular commodity, um, historically rum. Um, you can see here on this slide that in 1787, 73 of the 89 ships that departed from Portland Harbor, so this is 1787, the immediate aftermath of the American Revolution, 73 of 89 ships bound for the West Indies, indicating the importance of trade with the West Indies after the American Revolution. Following the repeal of the 1824 molasses tax, it became cheaper to produce rum in Portland than to import it from the West Indies. Hence, Portland had seven, seven rum distilleries along its waterfront in the early 19th century. And to the left there, you see a bottle of Screech rum 
uh, still distilled in Newfoundland today. And when I first moved to Maine about 15 years ago, I went to the Packy and I saw this screech rum and I was surprised to find rum produced in Newfoundland. But I think it's a, a remnant of this historic industry. Now, what my research reflects is that the rum produced in the West Indies cost more than the rum that was produced locally. So it was probably considered to be uh, a better high-end product. Uh, here I have a quote that I'd like to share with you. And this is from a wonderful essay uh, written by David Carey Jr. titled Comunidad Escondita, Latin American Influences in 19th and 20th Century Portland. And this was published in a great book called Creating Portland, a series of essays about different periods and topics in Portland history. And David Carey Jr. says, and here I'll quote, for much of the 19th century, Portland was a major entrepot of international commerce. And for those of you who are not familiar with the term entrepot, it just means trade center, um, a location where goods are shipped to and stored and then transshipped to another destination. So an, a major entrepot of international commerce in Portland at a time when Cuba was the United States' third largest trading partner, Portland was one of the major ports in the exchange and main ships were among the most common vessel, vessels traffic, trafficking in the West Indies. Ships loaded with lumber, bricks, and ice set sail for the Caribbean islands and returned with sugar, molasses, and rum, and goods to stock local grocery stores. And historically, grocery stores that carried goods shipped up from the West Indies would have a sign in the window that said WI Goods, which stood for West Indies Goods. Uh, these were um, a lot of different spices and occasionally uh, exotic fruits, um, among also sugar and rum, uh, tobacco, uh, sometimes chocolate, all considered to be West Indies goods. Here I'll quote again from David Carey Jr. And he says, the wealth generated in this trade affected Portland's physical environment from the landfill extended wharfs to the large homes that remain central to Portland's identity. The Portland bricks that dot the streets of Trinidad, Cuba still today, I'll show you a picture of those bricks in just a few minutes, uh, the Portland bricks that dot the streets of Trinidad, Cuba are symbolic of the intricate relations between Portland and Latin America. And so here you see a picture of the J.B. Brown Sugar Refinery. Uh, this is the largest building on the Portland waterfront uh, up until the Great Fire of 1866. You can see it's seven stories tall. Um, Portland imported three times as much molasses as Boston in the middle of the 19th century. Um, the Portland Sugar Works were processing 200 hogsheads, a hogshead being a 63-gallon cask or barrel, 200 hogsheads of molasses a day. By 1855, the business employed between 150 and 200 workers. And 10 years later, right before the Great Fire of 1866, almost 1,000 individuals worked at this sugar refinery. Um, most of them were recent Irish immigrants, by the way. Uh, they were known as boilers, and they lived in the community around the sugar house. The sugar house uh, was kind of very close to the neighborhood known as Gorham's Corner, which probably many of you know was the center of the Irish immigrant community uh, in Portland in the middle of the 1800s. Uh, so a lot of Irish immigrants worked there as boilers, boiling sugar. Now, about this time, 1860, 20% of all the molasses in the U.S. is processed right here in Portland. And that's more than any other city in the United States. And molasses, of course, uh, very important to uh, lumberjacks and farmers uh, working in Maine's interior. I got this great quote here. Without molasses, no lumbermen could be happy in the unsweetened wilderness. Pork lubricates the joints 
molasses gives tenacity to the muscles. And so the farms and lumber camps of Northern New England, including Vermont and New Hampshire, produce food and lumber for the sugar plantations. In fact, there's a great uh, passage in uh, another maritime history book that I'm familiar with, where the author discusses, you had all of these farmers uh, who in the late summer from New Hampshire farms and Vermont farms would come through the Crawford Notch in the White Mountains uh, with their wagons piled high with all of their produce that they had grown on the farm uh, that growing season, uh, driving their herds of cows and pigs uh, in front of them all to sell uh, on the Portland wharves uh, so that they can be plugged into this Atlantic world economy and much of them shipped down to the West Indies. Uh, in turn, lumberjacks and farmers consume large quantities of molasses and rum. And, you know, I'm really interested in food and history and um, the confluence of those two topics. And one of the things I love to share with people is, uh, you know, before refrigeration, uh, all of your food had to be preserved in some way. It had to be pickled or smoked or salted or in some way cured. And hence, your food probably didn't taste very good. Uh, and so you would want to sweeten it with molasses. Um, these goods are shipped into the interior and shipped back to the entrepot of Portland, um, what we call the, the hinterland, the interior, the, the metropole or entrepot of Portland. Uh, they're shipped back and forth using a system of canals that are built in the 1800s. The most famous of these canals is the Cumberland Oxford Canal, which com com was completed in 1830 and went uh, all the way from um, Sebago Lake and actually went beyond Sebago Lake, uh, but connected Sebago Lake all the way to Portland Harbor. And the Cumberland Oxford Canal terminated very close to uh, where the base of the Casco Bay Bridge is today. Um, and once again, I'll, I'll quote here from Rose Maritime History of Maine. He says, quote, during one winter, a country store in Pittston disposed of 90 hogshead, a hogshead is once again, a 63 uh, gallon cask, uh, 90 hogshead of rum. A boatman on the Cumberland and Oxford Canal reported that during the season, he alone delivered 300 barrels. Now a barrel is a 42 gallon uh, cask. Uh, he delivered 300 barrels to the towns along his route. So it gives you an idea, uh, you know, for how much uh, molasses and rum is being consumed in Maine's interior. Now, if you were a lumberjack or a farmer, working class individual, you couldn't afford um, granulated sugar. Uh, granulated sugar was a luxury commodity, and it would be formed into cones, like the cone that you see in the center there. Uh, and this was just something that rich people could afford. And so a well-to-do merchant in Portland uh, would have a sugar bowl, like the one you see at the top there on their dining room table. Um, and then they would use the sugar nips that you see on the left there and cut off a little bit of the sugar off of the cone there. Um, and they would say something like, oh, uh, what well, can I offer you some, some uh, refined white sugar for your tea there to their guests? And, um, you know, you think about that, then you have a, a tea, a luxury commodity produced uh, in the Far East being combined with a luxury commodity being produced in the West Indies. Uh, but once again, you know, this was only um, could be afforded by very well to do individuals. Uh, I have done some work recently with the Portland Museum of Art uh, on one of their exhibits, their passages exhibit, which I highly recommend. And um, I shared with some of the curatorial staff. Uh, this information and so they were curious they went into their collection uh, to see about how many sugar bowls they had and I, I can't remember the exact number but it was something like 70 something ornate sugar bowls uh, in the collection of the Portland Museum of Arts um, some of which are now on display in the gallery so once again I encourage you to check out the passages exhibit there but uh, a luxury commodity granulated sugar not uh, could not be afforded by most folks. Now, this is John Bundy Brown. 
This is the individual who built uh, the sugar refinery. He began his Portland, Maine career earning $50 a year at the Alphys Shaw's grocery store on Middle Street. Uh, he begins experimenting with sugar production. And so just to kind of clear things up, uh, molasses is a byproduct of sugar production, right? So you boil down the sugar juice and you can extract uh, the, the sugar from a certain amount of it, but at a certain point, it can't be refined any further. And what you're left with is molasses. And so what John Brundy Brown does is he gets one of his workers, dependents Furbish, to invent a method using steam power to produce a high quality granulated white sugar from molasses. And he builds the sugar house that I showed you the slide of a little bit earlier is just the third sugar house built in the United States. So in 1855, Brown forms the Portland Sugar House. Uh, the refinery, of course, burns during the Great Fire of 1866. And although Brown rebuilds his sugar business, never regains its national prominence. Uh, by that time, uh, there's uh, competition from other cities and other sugar refineries. Uh, Brown invests in railroads and banking and real estate, and he becomes Portland's largest landholder. Uh, and he builds his palatial mansion on land that he buys on the Western Prom. He buys most of the land on the Western Prom, uh, parcels it out, develops it, builds his palatial mansion there uh, in 1858, which was known as Brom Hill. And he sells off the other plots of land to his other rich, well-to-do merchant friends who build their mansions there. Uh, some of these mansions still remain today. And as many of you know, uh, a big part of the city's architectural identity. Brown also becomes a major patron of the arts. His large collection of American and European art is donated to the Portland Museum of Art. Uh, this following his death in 1881. Uh, where many of those pieces of artwork remain today. Uh, the building, his, his mansion, Bromville, uh, demolished by the Brown family in 1915. But as I said, many of the mansions that are on the Western Prom, as well as the Eastern Prom, uh, were built during this period. And this is the J.B. Brown building on Congress Street, right across from the main College of Arts. Uh, this was built by J.B. Uh, Brown's sons, Philip Henry and John Marshall, uh, between 1882 and 1883. And if you look at the building, you'll see that right over the front door uh, is the signature of J.B. Brown. Uh, they had the building built to honor their father uh, after he had passed. Uh, the Brown family real estate company is still involved in commercial real estate today here in Portland. In 2020, they developed 51 residential units and a retail space at 40 Free Street, and their website describes the company as still family owned. So think about this for a sec. The wealth that the Brown family generated from the labor of enslaved Africans in places like Cuba is still helping this family buy real estate in Portland today. It's a real testament to the power of generational wealth. Uh, this is the Safford House, 93 High Street. Uh, up until recently, this was the home of Greater Portland Landmarks, uh, built by merchant William Safford in 1858. He made much of his money through the importation of molasses from Cuba. Uh, he had an office in Cardenzas, Cuba, where he frequently journeyed to conduct his business. In fact, he's there so often that his daughter Inez is born there in Cardenzas in 1848. And so you see a lot of the merchants here in Portland would own what we would today call integrated means of production. So that meant that they would own the plantations in Cuba. Once again, Cuba is a Spanish colony at this time. They would own the enslaved Africans. They would own the plantations. They would own the ships that the molasses, sugar, and warm were shipped on. And then perhaps they would even own the means of refining that molasses once it got to Portland. Uh, 
Uh, so you see this with a lot of the uh, well-to-do merchants in Portland uh, during the 1800s. And this is a little out of focus, so if you'll bear with me here, uh, this is just one page of four pages of imports uh, to Portland for the year 1847. I got this at the um, through the Cape Elizabeth Historical Society. And so if we take a look here, you can see what's on a lot of these vessels is molasses. And then you can see the consignee. Uh, and you see J.B. Brown's name there quite a bit. J.B. Brown, J.B. Brown, um, cast of molasses. Uh, and then you can see where from. And the vast majority of these ports are in Cuba. So uh, Matanzas, Havana. Matanzas, Card Carden um, Cardenzas, um, Trinidad, Cuba. Once again, Havana, Cardenzas, uh, Matanzas. So it gives you an idea of you know, just how many vessels are coming into Portland, once again, 1847, directly from Cuba, and that the vast majority of them are carrying cargoes of molasses uh, amongst other commodities. And so here you can see, uh, this is Willard Beach. Uh, there you see the fishing shacks, which um, we just lost um, the two remaining fishing shacks during the big storm on the 13th of January. Um, but this is Willard Beach in South Port Portland. Uh, in the history of Portland, which was written by William Willis in 1831, he says, as early as 1745, there were owned at that precinct, and he's talking about Cape Elizabeth, later becomes South Portland, uh, but at this time, Cape Elizabeth, there were owned five schooners and five sloops, and at a subsequent period, the West India business was carried on there to a considerable extent, principally by William Symington, uh, once again, the area is also known as Symington Cove, and the aforementioned Ezekiel Cushing. Mr. Symington had a large and valuable wharf in the cove, which bears his name, where not only his own, but other vessels were found uh, pursuing a profitable trade. And so if you go to this point in the photograph here, where up until recently the fishing shacks were at low tide, um, and I like to go there with my kids and we go look for hermit crabs, uh, but you can still see the remains of Symington's Wharf, uh, wooden beams uh, and stone uh, crib work wharf uh, decaying into the South Portland waterfront uh, still there today. Uh, you also have many coastal ships built in main shipyards for the West Indies trade, uh, typically rigged fore and aft, which allowed them to sail into the wind to a greater degree than square rigged vessels that were built for transoceanic voyages. Uh, and sometimes these vessels would be built right here in Maine. They would be packed with goods from Maine. And then once they were got to the West Indies, they would be sold in their entirety, the vessel and all its contents. Uh, in addition to uh, lots of ships built in Maine for the West Indies trade, uh, one, this is a top sail schooner here. Um, you had a lot of smaller vessels that were built, uh, what we would today call lighters, uh, small boats for taking um, goods from the plantations out to vessels anchored uh, out at sea. If those vessels, if there was no dock or if it was too shallow uh, for large boats to approach, uh, the most famous of these were known as Moses boats. Uh, these Moses boats were used uh, as lighters. Um, other commodities shipped from Maine to the West Indies, uh, perhaps the most important was the codfish. Uh, once again, food preservation being so important at this time, the codfish takes the salting process better than any other protein. And so hence, it's the most affordable protein known to man before refrigeration and hence, large quantities of salt of cod are caught right here in the Gulf of Maine uh, and processed on the Portland waterfronts uh, to be shipped to the West Indies. And some of you may know that salt cod, uh, still today, very popular ingredient in West Indian cuisine. Uh, 
So you had four grades of salt cod. There was merchantable. This was the best quality fish based on the texture and color. Uh, Madaria, uh, almost as high quality as merchantable. This was fish that was shipped to Europe and they would have eaten this fish uh, in Catholic countries for uh, meatless Fridays. Um, and so you think uh, uh, Italy, Spain, France, Catholic countries uh, where they couldn't eat meat uh, on certain holidays and days of the week. Um, salt cod, large quantities of salt cod. Uh, salt cod still very important uh, in the cuisine of the European Mediterranean countries today. Then you have West India fish, a lesser quality salt cod that fed enslaved Africans in the West Indies. And finally, done fish or broken fish, not fit for trade due to its high moisture content. Uh, this was consumed locally. So check out this picture, very cool picture. Uh, this is the Portland fishing fleet in 1882. Some of you may recognize this location. This is today the back of Harbor Fish, a Harbor Fish market. And so back then, still as today, uh, fishing boats would come right up to the dock there and unload um, their, their patches right into the buildings there. And once again, I'll quote from Comunidad Escondita, uh, David Carey Jr. says, by the late 1820s, Cuba had become the world's largest sugar producer and most of it was going to the United States and England. Concurrently, Maine supplied Cuban planters with saltfish to feed their slaves and Portland was Maine's fish export center. By selling the food that sustained them, and consuming what they produced, Maine's major ports became a primary beneficiary of Cuban slaves' labor. David Carey Jr. goes on to say, Maine's historical relationship with slavery is complex. Its collaboration with Cuban slavery contradicts its stance against domestic slavery. And I would say that this is not entirely true. Some of you may know that we had in Portland in 1836, and again in 1847, two anti-abolition riots where people who were opposed to abolition rioted and prevented abolitionist speakers from speaking at what is today uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church on Congress Street. And in fact, there was one abolitionist speaker um, who was almost beaten to death uh, and spent several weeks recovering here in Portland uh, in the homes of local abolitionists. So uh, David Carey Jr. is not entirely correct when he says uh, that it's uh, Portland's stance was against domestic slavery. But he goes on to say, Portland entrepreneurs who feasted on Cuban sugar stood in stark contrast to Maine's abolitionist movement and the state's contribution of troops to fight the South in the Civil War. Paradoxically, Portlanders were structurally involved in slavery abroad, yet intolerant of it on their own soil. And then he uses this great term. He says this cognitive dissonance, this cognitive dissonance reveals moral standards that were malleable in the face of profits and comfort. Cognitive dissonance. It means that people in Portland just didn't want to think about it. Uh, once again, this is uh, Portland, 1882. Uh, this is what's known as a flake yard. And so uh, each one of those little white items that you see on these large tables is a fillet of salt cod that's been salted and then left in the sun to cure. Uh, you can see the extent of that flake yard, just how big of an industry this was. Uh, I've gotten several times the question, uh, what did they do about seagulls? Uh, and I just found out recently, uh, once again, I'll thank my friend Matt Anson, who uh, reminded me that at that time, uh, they would just kill seagulls. They were uh, the enemies of fishermen. And so uh, seagulls just would have been you know, killed in large numbers. There were not the number of seagulls uh, around that there are today. So uh, was not as much of a concern. However, they did have to worry about the rain. Uh, if it looked like it was going to rain, all of this would have to be taken off the tables uh, as quickly as possible, couldn't get wet. Uh, and then put back out in the sun once the rain had passed to continue curing as salt cod. Uh, once again, there's another picture here of the flake yards in Portland. Uh, 
Another major contribution to the trade between Portland and the West Indies was lumber, because much of Cuba's forests had been burned down or cut down to make room for sugar plantations. Maine supplied much of the lumber for building. Uh, for example, the port of Matanzas, Cuba, built almost entirely out of New England lumber. Uh, once again, David Carey Jr. says between 1856 and 1861, only 17 of 1,040 lumber cargoes went to any other place than Cuba. And from 1862 to 1864, about 1,000 vessels traveled from main ports to Cuba. Um, and so on there, I'll end quote, but also Havana re uh, received large quantities of main ship timbers in the 19th century for the large shipyard that they had at Havana where they built Spanish warships. So Maine furnished the lumber for that as well. Here we have once again, a photo from Linda Ash Ford showing you uh, the streets of Trinidad, Cuba, which as I mentioned earlier, still lined with the ballast stones of Maine ships uh, that traded there. But another commodity that was shipped to Cuba were bricks. Uh, there were lots of different brick kilns um, in Portland, but also throughout Maine. Uh, in fact, all you needed to produce bricks was the uh, right type of uh, marine clay, and you could set up a brick kiln pretty much anywhere. So it was another commodity uh, shipped to Cuba and other islands in the West Indies. Ice, ice to the West Indies. Now, it's a, a fascinating trade, the ice trade. Uh, if I had more time tonight, uh, I'd tell you more about the ice industry, but I just love these industries that um, very few people know anything about any longer. At one point in time, this was a, a major industry in Maine, um, ice harvested on the Kennebec River. Uh, first shipment of ice is shipped to the West Indies uh, from Bath in 1815. Uh, once again, lots of it harvest on the Kennebec River and stored in these massive ice houses uh, on the shores of the river. Today, not a single one of these ice houses remain. Uh, after ice out, when the river uh, thawed, you had vessels, schooners and such that would sail right up the river, uh, as you can see in this photograph right here, and they would load the ice directly from the ice houses and then sail to uh, all around the world. In fact, in 1833, they shipped a cargo of ice to Calcutta, India. Uh, the Consolidated Ice Company uh, Bodenham, for example, shipped ice to Cuba, Panama, and along the coast of South America. And this ice was used primarily in the Caribbean to cool drinks and to make ice cream at local cafes. And then also uh, what we would call today barrels, but a barrel, in fact, is just a size of cask. And so you can see all these casks in front of you, uh, a, a barrel being a 200 liter cask. Uh, we talked about hogsheads earlier, a pipe cask, uh, a tiersk, uh, cute little firkin down there at the bottom. Uh, and so here I'll quote Roe once again. He says, many small sawmills busy sawing and fitting the box boards to proper lengths, all ready to be set up and nailed on the sugar plantations. And I like to tell folks, you know, the cask was the ubiquitous shipping container uh, historically that everything was shipped in, whether it was dry goods or wet goods. Uh, apples, rum, salt mackerel, you name it, uh, it was shipped in casks. Um, the Cooper trade in the manufacture of hogshead and tierce shooks was one of the best paid in the towns near the coast. In 1867, there were 263 such shops in the state. And has, as been explained, uh, the shook was a package of red oak staves. Uh, headers, uh, and also hoops that were numbered and ready to be set up as cast a hogshead of tears uh, when they were needed in the West Indies. So they would take these casts, they would break them down to ship them to save space into their components of staves, headers, and hoops. They would then be assembled once they got to a place like Cuba, uh, and then packed with uh, molasses, um, they would do this with boxes as well. The boxes would be packed with sugar. Uh, and then Roe goes on to say that the uh, this was done by coopers on plantations or by state of Maine coopers who went to the islands for that purpose. And so you would have coopers from Maine who would go in the winter uh, to islands in the West Indies to put together these casks. 
And then my final slide here, and then I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, once again, Rose says, uh, trade with the West Indies. Also, house frames, whole houses, ready to put up, uh, oxen and horses for the plow. And here I'll tell you that uh, they, they desperately needed these draft animals, oxen and horses. And uh, in Suriname, which is a Dutch colony, um, the nation of Suriname today on the North shore of South America, they needed these draft animals so badly that they would not allow you to trade in Suriname unless you brought some draft animals with you. And hence in Rhode Island, they bred a special horse called a Suriname. It was kind of a short horse so they could ship them, but also very stocky so they could work the mechanisms on the sugar. And also in Suriname, they had uh, chocolate plantations. They shipped 30,000 Surinamas, these specially bred horses from Rhode Island to Suriname as draft animals, once again, gives you an idea of the scale of the exchange. Uh, oxes and horses for the plow, the sugar, and the treadmill. Farm produce such as parsnips, potatoes, onions, and grain. Beef, mutton, pork, pickled fish, soap, candles, and dried codfish in drums of from five to 800 pounds each. Lumber from the banks of Maine rivers, which cost their $8 a thousand, sold in Havana for 60. Beets and parsnips brought $16 a barrel in the French islands. So that's my presentation for you this evening. I, I see, it looks like Kathleen, that I still have a few minutes uh, mm -hmm. to take questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Seth. Um, we've definitely gotten a number of questions from the audience um someone you, you may have mentioned this but do you know why exactly was portland the molasses capital is that just it it was the sugar capital and that's where all the yeah I'm, I, I think that it had probably to do with uh shipping you know as many of us know maine uh, was known for its ship building and so large numbers of vessels you know built here but you know it was new england uh, that was a big part of New England's economy, uh, not just Maine. Uh, you know, New England really made its money in, um, you know, trade and some of this trade with Europe, but a lot of this trade, trade with the Caribbean, with the West Indies and, and trade with South America uh, as well. So, uh, you know, we didn't have here in Maine the the agricultural conditions to allow for large scale agriculture uh, like they had in the American South. Or even in Rhode Island, there were um, Eastern Connecticut as well. Um, the soil allowed for large scale agriculture, but that that was not possible here in Maine because of the weather, but also because the soil uh, somewhat rocky. And so the people here had to figure out ways, uh, other ways to make money. And they, um, you know, found out very quickly in the colonial period. Um, in fact, you know, John um, John Smith is writing uh, in the early 1600s. Uh, about these commodities of uh, codfish, uh, but also of lumber. And so that's what we had uh, to offer into this Atlantic world economy that I, well, that I was telling you about. And so that became uh, Maine's role. So kind of related to that question, um, someone else is asking or, or saying that they've read that Rhode Island was a major center of the rum trade. Do you think that Portland and, and Maine outpaced Rhode Island? Well, I'm not sure about that. That's a great question. I, I couldn't say, I could do some research and find out. Um, certainly, you know, a lot, a lot of rum produced here in Portland. Um, you know, Rhode Island was also known for its slaving voyages. So there was a lot uh, of the slave trade that transpired in Rhode Island. Uh, there was also um, slave traders here in Maine uh, but I don't think it was known um, quite as much as Rhode Island was for its slave trade, but to as whether or not um, they were producing more rum in Portland at a given time than they were in Rhode Island, I couldn't say um, with certainty. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, someone else asking, when you think about the intense human suffering that these enslaved people, these stolen Africans and their descendants, how that suffering gets separated from 
the story of the profits of this trade no. how do we account for that and the person's also asking is it, is it quite simply is this a because of their race because of the color of their skin or something else well you know um the idea of race comes around uh about 1500 in part as a justification for the enslavement right. of africans so right. before that you know we didn't have as uh, finite ideas of race uh, but what happens is you know when they you know and this has a lot to do with labor um you know you don't have a colony just because it's a fun idea you have a colony to make money and to make money you need labor um you know they enslaved first here in new england as many of you well know uh indigenous americans um you know here in maine they would enslave uh wabanakis uh from various tribes that they would capture in the various french and indian wars um and then um they start using uh, enslaved Africans. In fact, the first time this happens is in, uh, I believe it's 1638 during the Pequot War in Connecticut, mm -hmm. where they take a group of captured Pequots and they exchange them in New Providence Island for enslaved Africans who are then brought back to Connecticut. And that's how you wind up with some of your first uh, enslaved Africans. But I think that's why, Kathleen, it's so important that, you know, at the beginning of the lecture, I highlighted, um, you know, what these enslaved Africans went through these horrific conditions, the fact that their life expectancies on the island of Cuba were only seven years. Seven and, years. and I don't share that information just to horrify people. Sure. I share that information so that people have an understanding of, you know, this is this is how we came to be in the city mm -hmm. that we're in. Uh, this is why Portland has uh, this beautiful architectural heritage. This is why, um, you know, a lot of people how a lot of people made their fortunes here in Maine is, is directly off of the labor of these enslaved Africans. And so I think it's really important that, um, you know, we, that this is recognized and that we make that connection. That is, this was, you know, that the city of Portland was built directly off of the backs of enslaved Africans who labored in these horrific conditions and in, in many cases, uh, you know, died very young. Uh, and who were kidnapped from their homelands um, and, and you know, experienced horrible things that we we can probably only uh, imagine if we wanted to. Yeah. So I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to ask you just one last question from the audience. Um, but I'm going to take the liberty, too, of saying we've got a lot of questions. We don't have time to get to them all. If folks really have a burning question for you, they can find you at South Portland Historical Society to learn more and to follow up, correct? Absolutely. And Kathleen, you have my email address. Yep. So feel, feel free to share that with folks. Great. Um, and I would be, um, you know, uh, I'll do my best to um, answer um, people's questions uh, to the best of my ability. Sure. So I just put my email address in the chat. So folks, if you reach out to me with a question that we didn't get a chance to answer tonight, I'm happy to, to put you in touch with Seth. But one last question from the audience. Can you speak to when this trade, the West Indies trade ended? What led to the dying up of what had been this diverse and dynamic trade between Maine and the West Indies? Yeah, so I think that this trade is very robust right up until the beginning of the 20th century. So as I said, you know, African enslavement legal uh, on the island of Cuba until 1886. And it's it's not for no reason that, you know, Cuba becomes very front and center during the Spanish-American War. And as you many of you know, it's so important that we send a warship to Havana Harbor, uh, the Maine, which uh, winds up blowing up in Havana Harbor. But, you know, this, um, you know, the trade continues to be important even after emancipation in 1886 in Cuba, uh, you still have a lot of Africans who are working uh, in con conditions very akin to slavery. They might mm. not technically uh, be enslaved any longer, but uh, they're certainly not making, um, you know, good money and they probably can't afford to buy a house or anything right. along those lines. Um, so yeah, this, this trade uh, remains important, like right up until uh, the, the the 20th century and uh, a part of the reason why America goes to war with Spain uh, in 1898 is because of the significant uh, U.S. investments, um, economic investments mm -hmm. 
uh, in, in the island of Cuba. Um, you know, what I, what I failed to mention was really you see a kind of progression of, you know, initially mains trading with Barbados and islands in the British West Indies, then Haiti. And then after the Haitian Revolution in the late 1700s, really Cuba uh, became becomes very prominent along with uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Jamaica, Barbados, still important, but not as important as Cuba. So it's kind of a progression as you go through the mm -hmm. centuries of who we would be trading with primarily. Uh, Cuba this is really the 19th century. Well, thank you very much. This was a, a really interesting uh, and eye-opening talk. I want to thank you, Seth, so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. And thank you to the audience uh, for, for being here with us this evening. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kathleen. It was a pleasure. Our pleasure, too.